In today's episode, we're going to be discussing the 1984 James Cameron directed science fiction horror classic, The Terminator. That was such a long intro before <laughs> the name. <laughs> But to be fair, all of those things are really interesting about the film. So <laughs> the original Terminator. Yeah, sometimes I say I start talking and saying stuff and I don't even know what the next word that's going to come out of my mouth is. <laughs> I can't believe we've never done this film before. I mean, I guess, I is it a horror film? Is it a horror film? Now, I'm, I, I want to say yes. Yeah. I, I want to say it's of that is cut from the horror movie cloth. Yeah, the sci-fi horror genre. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's got a lot of the traits of like um like slasher movies from yeah. that kind of era where like say let's I don't know, what was a popular horror, horror movie from there? Like Friday the thirteenth and um Halloween. Well there's... it's very much like Alien with the body horror aspects of it and the fact that it's yeah. super sci-fi. And you definitely say Alien's a horror film. Alien is a horror movie, the first one, yeah. yeah. But it's it's, it's yeah, so it's like you got a pretty young girl who's being pursued by a killer. So it's kind of so true. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a slasher film. I see where you're going with yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's so the, he's the serial yeah. killer. Yeah, and she's the the Sarah Connor is the final girl or the the final yeah the first yeah. and final girl. <laughs> well, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because there's there's a string of women that get killed before her. So yeah, just like, other Sarah Connors. Yeah, just like Halloween, how there's like loads of girl yeah. babysitters that get killed, right? Yeah, and there's that bit when the detective is figuring out that they're all called Sarah Connor, and it could then turn into a true crime like film, you know, if if it yeah. wasn't if it didn't have the sci-fi bit. It would have actually been a really cool film about um, everybody with the same name dying and mass hysteria with everybody who had that same name. Yeah. The phone book killer. <laughs> I'm so, sure there's a film like that out there. There must be. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. What did... So So I've seen this movie before a billion times. And I mean, I grew up... I was watching this movie like when I was like six or seven years old. Like, you know, that's yeah. how far back. I remember like when this was on video cassette and I remember seeing like when you when a newspaper would come through the letterbox there'd be like leaflets inside the newspaper and there used to be this um uh kind of oh gosh I'm going to I'm sure people that are listening to this are going to are going to like murder me for getting this wrong but there used to be this uh kind of mail in uh record company where you could mail in to get CDs or records or VHS tapes and I think it was called Britannia or Britannica Britannia Ooh. I think it was called Britannia and I just remember seeing the Terminator VHS on it not having no like having no idea what it was but I just remember the iconic image of Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. with the glasses yeah and as a kid just drooling over that image thinking I want to watch this <laughs> oh, <know>. so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, wh what was your first experience with this movie and what did you think of it? So, like you, I have grown up with this film, particularly because my dad was a bodybuilder. He was in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so when I was really young, he wanted to show me like, oh, how cool is it that he was in this film? And he loved... We used to have, and it reminded me watching it again, we used to have these like, we used to jokingly call them like manly, manly men film nights <laughs> where we would just watch <laughs> like <laughs> Rocky, <laughs> Rocky or Terminator or just films that were a godfather, all the all the films that you think, yes, men like, men like film. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And this like is one of them. meatball movies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there is a certain like special aspect of these films where it is just a lot a load of testosterone thrown into a film with lots of men being men and sweaty and big and muscular <laughs> it's just like it's so it, it's so quintessentially manly that I kind of love it um so I have seen this film a lot and I did again study at university this right, is part right. of the same course that I did uh, Alien in. Who knows what the theme was? I think it was like <laughs> monsters in film. And he was yeah. one of the monsters that we did. Um, yeah. And it was actually, it was really interesting because it was all about the ideal male figure. And because mm -hmm. he is like chiseled out of stone. He's, in, just He's like insane. Mr. Universe or something. Yeah. Or yeah. And, and so it was the best person to choose, I think, for this. To, to have somebody that was like almost not real in real life. Like if you saw him in real life, you'd think, is that real? Is that a real person? Because it he's just insanely jacked um, and he's just really cool. So it was perfect. 
Um, but yeah, I have always had, I've always been very fond of this film. I had actually forgotten quite a lot of it when I watched it back. Like I obviously Me remembered, too. yeah, I remembered some of the staples. Um, I've always remembered the scene where he goes into the police station and he wants to speak to Sarah Connor. And then yeah. they're like, you can't speak to her. And then he goes out and drives the car into the, <laughs> into the police station. But yeah, I've forgotten but- all of the other police station scenes for example like I I forgot that they were there for so long and so you watch it back you're like oh yeah there is more to this film than I think of when I think of the Terminator so I'm glad we watched it again yeah yeah no I I totally agree like after watching it in preparation for this episode I'd I'd realized how long it had been since I last watched it yeah and uh because as a kid I watched this so many times um and um yeah, watching it as an adult again after a long time. There's so many little bits that I picked up on, and and I was th- there were entire scenes I'd forgotten all about, and I was thinking, is this some kind of like extended edition with extra yeah. scenes that I don't remember or something? But I don't know about you, but so like we so I had this film on VHS growing up, but it wasn't like a professional VHS; it was just recorded from TV. Yeah, and um, I've I'm so used to watching that VHS tape that watching this again on I think I streamed it on Amazon Prime or something I don't know yeah. what I streamed it on and um the quality of the image on a streaming is so crystal clear and so good and the sound is so like there's so much clarity in the sound and yeah. everything that it feels I, I there's something about it that I didn't like uh, it's, it's so, too clean it's too clean and too perfect I mean that's that's a ter- that's not a bad problem to have but I'm just so used to the the crappy VHS tape yeah and um yeah that is it just it didn't feel real it just felt like a, it honestly felt like I was watching some kind of different movie like some kind of long lost remaster with all the extra scenes or maybe the tv version that that i watched back in the day maybe had scenes cut out maybe because that's kind of a common practice from back in the day they would always cut out clips and to to make it a bit more suitable for tv true well yeah bring back the pixelated pirated vhs's (laughs) rather than all this new technology that we have with prime and everything (laughs) yeah i mean i feel like I, like I said, the scenes that I'd forgotten, I was like, there's so much more substance, I think, to this film. I mean, it's not, (laughs) I don't think it was ever made to be a particularly thought provoking. Well, there are parts of it where you're like, oh, that's really cool. Mm. But I I think it was made to be an action film where like the premise is that this woman's getting stalked by a cyborg from the future. I mean, it's never going to be the most top end kind of sophisticated movie ever. And that's okay. But there are surprisingly, lots of pop parts where it makes you think about the future and especially I know you probably wrote this down as well but the, the fact that the future was 2029 yes a few years from now that's right uh, literally yeah. <laughs> years from now I was like well that's depressing we don't have very long until our civilization just goes to hell and we're taken over by the robots well the timing is quite apt because like AI has really taken off in the last few years and it's gonna take over I'm just waiting for the day I I go online and I see something like I don't know whichever military force the navy or whatever uh decides to implement ai into their missile guidance systems or something they all go off at once (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. i mean i i do find those future scenes quite funny because again you have to just think about it that it was done at the time but they Mm. are almost like puppetry some parts of it because they their cgi is like a little bit old oh you know it hasn't caught up as much <laughs> it's a bit well it's it's well it's not not even cgi it's even oh, even more primitive than that but it's funny because when i was watching the opening se- the the future war sequence i thought it i was i just thought it was fantastic i was so in love with it and i love how because i think a lot of the 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 kind of monster monsters machines they use in in the opening sequence like those giant tanks and whatnot and the flying machines i think they're all miniatures and yeah it looks like they are yeah yeah and i I thought it still holds up but the whole oh gosh with this movie i just think it's shot so damn well considering so like just a bit of background like this terminator was a low 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 budget movie this was like a b movie low budget movie yeah and um in back in 84 it wasn't term the first terminator movie is like a cult classic like yeah. it wasn't even 
it wasn't a massively big box office smash back in the 80s. It wasn't like it went up against movies like Beverly Hills Cop and uh, I think one of the Indiana Jones movies. I forget which one uh, that might have been Temple of Doom. And yeah, and the first, yeah, the first Ghostbusters movie. Sorry, I don't know if I mentioned that. So those were like big, big movies that yeah. made like 200, 300 million dollars. Whereas I think the first Terminator movie made less than 100 million. I think maybe even less than 90. It made, it didn't, yeah. Um, but for, for for its low budget and how it was made like i think it's done incredibly well i i think the the visual style like the the kind of dramatic way the movie's lit as well like there's it's like a film noir almost and um it's like a yeah like a science fiction if film noir was a science fiction yeah crossover like you know this kind of what it looks like and i just think it just oh man i was watching like what re-watching the bits when terminator and carl reese kind of come back in time mm. and just how the way the streets of los angeles are lit up and, and yeah. captured like there's uh yeah i just thought it looked wonderful it looks beautiful it's still it's just just holds up and uh it reminded me quite yeah. a lot of gotham city it was very like you know the worst parts of the city so you had like a lot of the scene where um what's his name the, the dude um what carl reese carl reese yeah when he yeah. gets dropped in and he's like you know in an alley and there's like newspapers yes, flying yeah. everywhere and you always think that there's going to be somebody around the corner and i think a lot of it is shot at that night or yeah yeah, yeah. the same night and it's like slightly raining and it's just very like you say film noir it gives a very good atmosphere and I also love the music in it. It was so eighties, like you know, just that. What kind the of... sound, the uh, the backing score, or the or the music, music. Like the backing score, so like sure, the sure. you know, just the atmosphere that it built. That it yeah. was like, oh, something's coming, something's gonna happen, and you're yeah. you're constantly like, what's coming next? And I think what was really good is that it just went straight into it. You know, the Terminator lands in his Olympus pose on the floor, yeah. and he <laughs> just instantly starts ripping people up, and it. It's just, honestly, it, obviously he makes this film. I know that he's not a great actor. I know that, like, that's not the reason why he's so good in this. It's just because it's who he is and the kind of the law around him as being Mr. Olympia, being the most amazing bodybuilder at the time. And even now, he's still considered, like, one of the greats. Having someone like that was a stroke of genius. And I did read, and I'm sure you saw the same thing, um, that O.J. Simpson was considered to be Terminator, but the producer feared that he'd be too nice and that nobody would believe that he would be a killer. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's I mean that's gone around for yet for decades that that but I think it that's like a myth or a or a, yeah but 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 the idea of it is that like you you want they wanted someone that they thought could be a killer so they yeah, thought OJ Simpson could yeah, be a killer yeah. and so they weren't gonna cast him whereas I think Arnold Schwarzenegger's like at the, the way that he is it was so robotic and it's probably because I mean it's a bit harsh but because he's probably not a great actor because he hadn't really done much acting apart from like one other thing he is very robotic <laughs> and so it works being yeah. a robot with no feelings <laughs> yeah that's it's, a, it's an interesting one that because I think um oh gosh I could be misremembering this but I think the original intention of the Terminator character so in in the movie Carl Reese references that uh oh Cyberdyne systems model 101 infiltration unit or whatever and I think that kind of hints to the Terminators are meant to be in like master infiltrators where they, they could be anyone look, in society yeah whereas Arnie sticks out like yeah. sore thumb like he's like t 10 foot tall compared to everyone else and like eight foot wide and I think I oh gosh I think uh so one of the so you know there's the two detectives that are chasing after Sarah or whatever yeah <laughs> Sorry, the the white guy, Lance Henriksen. Yeah. I think he was the, I think the intention was originally to have him as oh, the really? Terminator. Oh, because he, yeah. he would blend in. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, the producers wanted Arnie to be Kyle Reese. Right. And, um, but... Cameron didn't want when he when they met Cameron didn't want Arnie because Arnie's just too big and and I yeah. think uh, Arnie started was veering more towards the Terminator character when he was reading the script or something he was more yeah. interested in the Terminator character so I think some you know things just worked out the way they worked out and they all you know they all got on well and everything and Arnie got but I think that works that works so much better because you want to feel intimidated by this character and almost feel like it's so hard 
to kill him and it's so hard to get away from him because you know he is so ruthless and is just imposing by himself regardless of the fact that he's also yeah yeah, massive screen presence like literally a massive screen presence um so what did you think of like watching it back was there anything that stood out to you this time around that you were like oh i you know either didn't remember that or that was a really cool bit oh gosh there's lots i think i've got so much um so many notes i was taking on this film so so you know (laughs) random bit of trivia so lance henriksen the guy who plays the white detective i forget his name was it traxler or something oh that might have been the other guy i forget he him and bill paxton so bill paxton was one of the punks at the beginning you know when they're like nice night for a walk and yeah yeah. takes his clothes yeah so bill paxton and lance henriksen i think are three actors that have all been in a i think they might have all been killed by as well they They've all been in a Terminator movie, an Alien movie, and a Predator movie. No way. And I think, I think, I might, I might be misremembering, but I think all three of them have been killed by their respective... The thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Lance Heinrichsen gets killed by the Alien Queen, maybe? I don't remember. But yeah, anyway, they're in all... Th- so Alien, Terminator, and Predator are like the big three sci-fi monsters yeah. from like the 80s uh, slash late 70s so i think that's quite a quite a unique privilege yeah it's like you're you're just a perpetual victim in these like cult classics <laughs> yeah we need to get them in more well sadly we can't with bill paxton as he passed away a couple of years ago but with lance henriks and we need to get him in more science fiction movies get him killed just by to more. kill him off again <laughs> <laughs> get killed up by more yeah other guys and whatnot um i, I liked how um I mean, these are just little touches, but I liked how when Arnie lands, you know, in in the in in the, in in LA, how he's totally unfazed by the time travel process. He just stands up, walk walks with purpose to the edge yeah. of the. I think it's the Griffith Observatory. Looks over LA. You know, he's just very purposeful with his movement. Goes to the punks, kills them, gets the, you know, gets their clothes. And by contrast, you got Carl Reese who really suffered through the time travel process. Yeah. He's there trying to catch his breath, and he's in. Yeah. Pain and he and uh in contrast he he when he takes his clothes off the homeless person he doesn't kill the homeless person he just no. kind of steals his pants or whatever but yeah i just yeah that kind of I, I just love how how that kind of contrast exists it's just something very subtle but kind of sets the stage for and and even as a viewer like if you're watching this movie for the first time <laughs> Sorry, like, you know, and you have no idea what this film's about and you don't know who Arnold Schwarzenegger or anyone is, you might not even realise which one of these is the bad guy yeah, and which one of these is the hero. Yeah, exactly. And you'd, you'd know that something was up. Like, you know, you know that something's wrong with the difference between the two of them. Yeah. But you might not necessarily exactly know which one, which one is which or whether they're both on one side like they but could both be bad but just bad in different ways but you, but yeah. you know from the beginning that there's something wrong with the terminator because like you say he just and he's also massive he's not a normal person no. so it's like okay <laughs> there is there's something no no and and prior to this movie schwarzenegger had made uh the first two conan the well the only two conan the barbarian yeah. movies that he's in at least and uh he was the hero in both of those yeah. so, so he's he... a traditional hero so you know he could like misdirect the audience and yeah i feel like he's always tried to not be typecast in what he does because he did this and then obviously later on did twins is it twins yeah he did that in a couple of years after well yeah Yeah. so he clearly wanted not to be typecast as the hero the villain the funny guy he wanted to do a bit of everything in his you know relatively short movie career but i think from watching the documentary about him it have you seen it the arnold schwarzenegger Uh, documentary uh i i I think so yeah yeah what i took away from that is that everything that he did he wanted to do it to the best of his ability so if he was going to go into movies he was going to work really really hard to do it right if he was going to go into politics he was going to work really hard and actually become the governor um you know like all of the things he did he put 100 percent into and i think he definitely put 100 percent into this role as well as the other characters like i think that they all worked really well together i think it's hard sometimes when you're watching a film for the 10th time to Mm. appreciate what it would have been like to watch it for the first time and and feel the terror that sarah connor starts to feel as she realizes what's going on and I think the scene that I loved was when she goes into the club because she knows she's being followed and there's a lot of misdirection, who she's supposed to trust, you know, 
and then suddenly like she's just sitting there and the the sea of people opens up and then the terminator is just walking towards her and it, that is when you think this is definitely a horror film because that really freaks you out and you just want to shout run like get out of there which he eventually does but it it's really good at building up this feeling of unease to a point where it, it peaks and you're like oh no this is really bad like this person is definitely out to get you but we have no idea why if this is the first time we're watching it we don't know why and so it's interesting to watch because you think why would they like, a where have they come from didn't know they go back in time at this point you know why sarah connor what's possibly could she have she's a single woman that doesn't have a boyfriend and is you know it does is working in a cafe yeah. like all these things work together to make it really interesting yeah yeah that um scene with the with the nightclub is is probably my favorite scene in the film yeah um, and the way he walks through like they're like you need to pay <laughs> he just walks through <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah because at that point in the film sarah has discovered through the news that there are other sarah connors that are being killed off yeah and then by this point kyle reese uh, he, it's funny because that with the Terminator, he's just working his way through the phone book and killing every single Sarah Connor that exists. Yeah, whereas Carl Reese doesn't. Yeah, whereas Carl Reese doesn't do that. He already knows who she is because how it's revealed later on the film, Carl Reese had always had a photo of Sarah Connor his whole life, so he knew exactly what she looked like. Yeah, and then but he didn't know who the Terminator was. Yeah, so he literally had to wait for the Terminator to make a move on Sarah before he could kind of take it or attempt to take it out. Attempt to take it out. Yeah. And and um, that, that just the way this that scene works, like how you got the the music in the in the club, is it, uh, and uh, how it kind of like merges into it starts to go in slow motion, how it merges into the Terminator scary music, yeah. And just how everything goes in slow motion, and Sarah's so concerned with Carl Reese who's following her that her focus yeah. is on him. She doesn't even see bloody Terminator coming out, you know, yeah. coming up from the side of her until his red laser is on her head. And, and the what... fact that, like, he because he's a machine, he has no concept of other people, so he just starts shooting in this club. And that's another scene where you're like, that this is either the the most cold blooded killer or something is wrong with him because he just open fires in the club and again it's the contrast between the two men because you know the terminator does not care about anybody else he just has a target that he needs to reach he's just yeah he's just programmed and then the thing is once he you know if once he's completed his mission he's he's no longer required he just he would essentially just i don't know go into hibernation or shut himself down or whatever but i thought the name of the club was quite interesting so it's called the club was called tech noir yeah and um so and I think uh, uh, the James Cameron refers to this the genre of this movie as tech tech noir, so like uh -huh. film noir, but a science fiction tech noir movie. So like similar to stuff like Blade Runner and whatnot. It's a really cool name for a club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what one of uh, one of the other meanings I took away from this from the move from tech noir is like tech noir, like dark technology or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like the Terminator and Skynet and whatnot are like dark technology in this universe where it's like tech gone bad or whatever. Or, yeah. And I, I wasn't sure if it was like a like a double meaning or something. But yeah. I mean, it probably it probably was because there's so many points in the film where you, once we understand what the future is going to be like, we're reminded of where the world is heading because we have flash forwards. And we see yeah. what life is like. And then we see the, the toll that it takes on Kyle as a person who's lived there. You know, he's got scars all over his body. He's like haunted. And then you go back to the present day and it's very different. Although it's not, what I like about this film is it doesn't just make like uh, modern times good, future times bad. It's like the modern no. times aren't necessarily better, like it's better, but it's not necessarily good. Because like you say, it's very dark and mysterious and like it does, it has a little bit of that grungy city element to it. But it's obviously better than the future where it's just bones and disease and very gross. Yeah, yeah, touching upon that one one scene i wish the film had is and i don't know where you would have inserted it but maybe when carl is still looking for sarah and he's in uh daylight in la just the scene where he kind of absorbs everything around him and yeah because you know just maybe it catches a moment where he can't believe where he is because he comes from like this ravaged post-nuclear yeah. war post-apocalyptic future and now he's in a place where there's trees and blue skies yeah <laughs> you know, so. that's a really good point and it, it would have been nice for it for him to be sad because of that you know you, you you can see in his face that he's really sad that he doesn't have any of this 
And like when you watch it for the second time, you're like, oh, that's why he looked like that. That's a really cool idea. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, with the music, the Terminator theme, I think, is meant to be, you know, with the... Du, 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 yeah. Know, I think that's meant to be like the Terminator's heartbeat. Ah. And and uh, the pulsing of it, well, his pulse or heartbeat yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I think that's where I think that's where it comes from, like a machine's heartbeat, because it's all very synthesized and mechanical. Like it, it, it is. sounds like yeah, because it sounds like bits of metal bashing against each other or something. Yeah. And I do like, I mean, at the beginning of the film, it's quite hard to visualise the Terminator not being a person because it is obviously a human who's playing him. And so, you know, Carl obviously explains that as they've got better, Terminators now look like everybody else. They've got a blood and flesh and everything muscle on top of their skeleton. Mm. And as the film goes on and the Terminator gets hurt more, well, not Mm. hurt, but broken up more and more and more, it starts to reveal itself as more more of uh you know a, a robot and yeah. it makes it more scary as you go through because you then can realize how cold this killer is because you can actually see that it is not a human and i like that progression i like that it kind of slowly he morphs himself into this literal skeleton of just uh you know metal but <laughs> i did i don't want to be too mean but there were a few scenes that made me laugh out loud when like oh, the yeah. <laughs> prosthetics where he takes his eye out that scene yeah. is oh, the, so the, bad like i i did get, yeah it's it's it goes from here's a shot of arnie's face and then here is a very very unrealistic polyester uh, plasticine <laughs> head or whatever <laughs> Papé mâché, Papé mâché head <laughs> with the most ridiculous hair on top of it, and I I understand what they're doing. It's hard to do that, but I do. That was the only scene where I was like, I think they could have been a bit more clever in the way that they did that because thinking about Alien, that's older than this. Yeah, like there are scenes in that that are so realistic. Like we said in the Alien episode, when what's his name gets his head chopped off, and they they do it so that he's obviously his his real head is coming through the floor. Like they've made it look like he doesn't have a head. I feel like they could have had some movie magic to get that eye out in a I, <laughs> in a better way. I I I, I mean I, I haven't I can't verify this because I haven't checked, but Alien was like a big studio film. Like oh, of uh, course, yeah. It, I, it I guess the budget. Like, yeah, I guess the budget yeah. does make a difference. Whereas with Terminator. You know when they shot the scenes on the street? It yeah. was literally just a camera crew running <laughs> on the street in the middle of the night. Action, go. Okay, let's run. Next location. It was that kind of... Uh, wow. They didn't have permits to shoot um, from what I... Or like, I don't know if that was just applied to the reshoots or whatever, but it was that kind of like um, rough and ready kind of yeah. filmmaking from what I've read, at least. And uh, actually, give me one sec. Well, let's see what the budget for Alien was, because it might give a better understanding of... Um, but even with, even with a low budget, I think you can do some camera work to make it look more realistic. It's yeah, so just alien... the fact it's just the fact that it was like normal head, prosthetic mm-hmm. head, normal head, prosthetic head. And it was very obvious which was which. Oh yeah. Like yeah, even course, if they did yeah. it from the back or like they shot the back of his head and they you could watch his eye coming out, but you couldn't quite see where it was coming from. But it was obviously his real head or from the side or something. But like I know that I think they were just trying to make it super gross because you could see everything that was going on. But by doing that, they've almost ruined a little bit of that goriness because it's so obviously fake. So, you know, it's like, do you balance it out by, okay, you don't get the gore factor by physically seeing his eye being taken out, but you do keep the audience within the realm of this being real if you just do something like Yeah, yeah. I see now I see where you're coming from. I mean, yeah, obviously it does look a bit fake and whatnot. Um, it's never really bothered me. I think it's weird because if I saw a realistic looking Arnold Schwarzenegger face in that scene, I think it would, I'd feel weird about it because I'm so used to seeing the yeah fake, the fake head. Uh, and I'm also grateful that they never went back and remastered it or, you know, and yeah. tried to put Arnie's face in and, and whatnot. But I think once they started sh- showing the scenes where he's, you know, he's ripped the skin off his forearm and he's messing around with the gears of his yeah. fingers That's and whatnot. That's good. Like, that yeah, was really like, good. Yeah, like that scene, and even the eye scene, that's where it 
so as a kid that's where it sold it for me that oh this is a machine yeah yeah and um i think i mean maybe i'm just adding meaning here but maybe when they do show the the the, the play-doh head and the eye moving around i think it might just be a reminder to the audience that this is not a human this is a machine this mm. is uh, yeah don't be fooled i don't know i don't know i'm just adding i think yeah. i'm just covering for them for uh, you know un <laughs> unsolicited cover un unsolicited covering for them but yeah <laughs> But it is cool, like it's it's cool how yeah he slowly becomes bit just a skeleton, and at the end scene he is fully completely lost any humanity. And I read that um, James Cameron had I think he said it was a dream that he had that it was like a solid chrome torso that was like chasing him or something like that and dragging itself on the floor and that he yeah. thought about so, this film after having that dream yeah so he was working on a movie called Parada 2 which he was directing for I don't know if it was Roger Corman or someone I don't remember but um, and I think he was I think during the post-production of the film he was fired or something and I think he was already in, I think they were shooting in Rome and uh, I think it's something I think he got sick out in Rome and was having a fever dream or something where right. he uh, I think I think he dreamt up the um the skeleton the, the metal skeleton or whatever but um <clears throat> it turns out that that the story or something for, for terminator is actually very similar to an episode of uh, i think it's the twilight zone or something oh. what does somebody and come back in time and have to say something some being born or something like that it's i'm sure it's it's written down somewhere but i don't know where it is but yeah so i think the and there was some kind of like court case or lawsuit or something oh. where the original uh, creator or whatever uh, you know told the studio you know we're going to take you to court or whatever because you've stolen that story but i think they settled out of court or something like i think cameron maintains that he did not steal anything right. but he was kind of strong-armed by the studio just to accept the settlement or whatever just so there's no problems later yeah, on yeah just to just to deal with it yeah because you see like harlan El is it harlan ellison's name appear at the end credits it's like one of the first names that appears that's like you know uh, inspired by the works of harlan ellison or whatever oh right like just to yeah, appease yeah. appease them yeah 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 but you know i do feel like that last scene where the terminator is like dragging itself to towards sarah and you're like oh my god she must be so exhausted after everything she's gone through and like yeah. she's seen <laughs> everybody die and like all this stuff and that final crushing scene where she crushes the head and, and you know he's he's come back alive so many times like he's he's been able to get out of the fire he's been able to chase him down with like limbs missing and things and then that really iconic bit where his eye goes red goes from red and slowly just dies yeah is yeah. that the first time that anybody used that because obviously that's quite cliche now to see like so a, a computer or something dying by the light going out in its eye the the um literal led light going out in its eye mm -hmm. but i feel like that must have been the first time that that was done because it's it's very poignant when you think about it you know yeah yeah i mean i i, I can't think of any other movie where they might have done it or at least as well as it's done in this film yeah, yeah. it's 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 I, re I really like how you know how one of the horror movie tropes uh, you see it in loads of these horror movies like Halloween and Friday the 13th of that era where when you take the bag where the monster's killed you think he's killed but there's one final s s jump scare or something yeah you know? and I love how in this film they don't just do like just one final jump scare it's like it's almost like you've killed one boss and now the boss has changed form yeah. to his next form and now you gotta go and go for a second round and kill him again so first Terminator is like you know the truck blows up uh, when Carl Reese throws the that pipe bomb into the truck and the truck blows up and they think they've killed Terminator but yeah then he rises from the ashes you just see that yeah. kind of all the rubble falling you know Terminator standing up and the rubble's falling off him and yeah. it's like stop motion animation or whatever of Terminator standing up and uh and you just see like I think Sarah and Carl are hugging each other and then they just turn around and look and just yeah they're like, can't believe what they're seeing. And I think this is probably like the wow moment for the audience when yeah. they finally see the exoskeleton or the endoskeleton of the, yeah. of the Terminator. And then Terminator's like chasing them into the factory. I I love that final scene where like the way they merged kind of like using a model Terminator skeleton and and, and the stop motion animation. Yeah. And they kept cutting back and forth and then yeah. just the way it was all lit. And I love the close-ups of the Terminator model when you know it's a physical model being puppeted yeah. around and you just see the bright red light lights in the darkness and it's just yeah and i loved how with the lights on the eyes how they got smaller how they dilated and yeah it's almost like gave it feeling gave yeah, it motion. yeah 
Yeah, and one thing I thought was genius, and I never, I mean, obviously I was aware of this when I was a kid, but I never really understood the gravity of it when I was a kid, is, you know, when when Terminator, when Arnie is, like, going into the truck the first time after his accident, he's, like, kind of dragging his foot. Yeah. And then after you see the Terminator skeleton dragging its foot. Yeah. You know, when he's in skeleton form. And I think that's, like, a nice little <clears throat> link. Which a reminder, reminds the, yeah. Yeah, it reminds the audience that this is the same character, like, yeah. that this is the same person. So I thought it was, that was genius. And I think I think James Cameron, he's, oh, gosh, he's, he's a genius for doing little things like that. They kind of go under the radar for a lot of people, I think, where there's, there's more than surface level. Like, when you first go into the factory, when the, they're escaping the terminator you notice in the background when when carl reese starts turning every all the equipment on to so it can kind of give him cover you you see the crushes in the background start yeah and then so it may be on a subconscious level it shows the audience that that crusher exists and then later on in the scene i think sarah kind of turns one of the crushes on by accident yeah so, so now the audience reminder. is yeah. the audience is reminded but also this time it lets sarah know that this exists yeah and then finally at the end when you know because it isn't just you know when when, when the terminator is in the crusher and sarah's reaching for a button she's not just fluking it she knows this she has a plan yeah yeah so it's kind of and i like I, just, I, yeah. I i always really liked that scene because it it allowed the humans to win because they're human so the terminator's job is just to kill sarah and so it just continues to to go and go and go with no feeling no idea nothing it just goes whereas yeah. sarah almost realizes right at the very end that she can beat this thing by being sneaky and by using all of the things that make us human to kill it which is to trick it you know yeah. get it yeah. to follow her and you don't really know what she's doing until the very end. And like you said, yeah. she knows what she's doing when she goes and hits that button. And a Terminator wouldn't have thought of that because it's just a machine that's like, kill, 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 find quickest way to kill. And so I, it kind of gives you that, ah, the humans prevailed because of their humanness. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with you, yeah. There's uh, something that never really ever made sense to me when I was growing up. Maybe I just didn't think about it, but... So there's a novelization of this movie, which includes a bit more detail than the movie does. Oh. And there's two things in the in the book that... I've not read the book, but I've only just found this out online. Yeah. But there's a... Apparently there's like a deleted scene from the movie that I've not seen. Or I don't know if, if, if it was even filmed, but... Um, so when, when Carl Reese is making the pipe bombs, the reason reason they were doing that was because I think they wanted to go to the Cyberdyne factory to blow it up or something. Yeah. That was the original purpose of it. And um, But they don't say it in the movie, but there's, apparently uh, in one of the deleted scenes from the factory, I think the camera pulls away or something and you see the Cyberdyne sign for the factory. Oh, that's the factory. Yeah, yeah. So they were actually heading towards that factory. It was, the factory wasn't just like something they encountered randomly. They were right. intentionally going towards the factory. And, um, and then in the factory Tree, uh, apparently the a police officer or, or someone picks up the chip from the Terminator. And I think oh. that's how Cyberdyne gets the technology to build the Terminators. Oh. So it all kind of... So maybe there was this kind of uh, destiny to, to the story where the Terminator is trying to kill Sarah Connor, but in order for that Terminator to even exist, Cyberdyne needed the technology. Yeah. And so they led themselves, all three of them somehow led themselves to this factory where the term, where even though Sarah survived, the Terminator technology was then handed. Yeah. To so if, if Sarah had died earlier and they never made it to the factory, then she actually wouldn't have ever died because the Terminator wouldn't have existed. Because Maybe. I don't know. Because that's, that's what's complicated about it is that if you think about it, everything in this film Mm. had to have happened like there was no yeah. other alternative because Sarah, uh, Sarah needed to get pregnant so she had to have met Kyle and so but that means that if Kyle never came back none of this would have happened because she would never have got pregnant so it's like I, like everything I, I, has to happen <laughs> so it's this weird kind of paradox where yeah because yeah how would Kyle have come back if and so in the first instance how would she have got pregnant because Kyle wouldn't have come back yeah but and that's what I always thought but I think there's a get out of jail free card here do you remember Sarah was meant to go on a date and the date stood her up yeah. I think 
if the whole Kyle Reese thing never happened, she would have gone on, a, on another date with the guy and he would have been the father. Yeah, but that still wouldn't have made sense because it wouldn't be the, the same kid. And also the reason why, what's his name? Connor, Sarah John, Connor's John, son. John Connor. Yeah. John Connor would never have become the leader because he only became the leader because Sarah Connor, his mother, uh, bred, like, uh, raised him to be a, a warrior. Because that's what Kyle says. He's like, she, he became who he is because of his mother. Yeah, yeah. It's so, like that wouldn't have happened if I mean, she it had, still, had. It could have still happened. Well, it's less likely though because <laughs> if she had sex with somebody else and none of this happened, why would she ever bring him up to be a fighter? And like, he could have just been like a weedy tech, you know, just like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but maybe it was more. Maybe uh, I mean, the only way I can kind of justify it to, or make it make sense to me is maybe it had no relevance who the father was ever. It, like maybe yeah. that. Maybe it was always about Sarah, and it was always going to be no matter who her kid was, they would have turned out to be a, she would have, you know, after the war would have happened or whatever, she would have trained her kid to be a, you know. Right. So regardless of what her, I don't know. I mean, it's hard because like you say, the timeline is a cycle. So all of the stuff only happens because it's already happened. So it's really confusing. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few different schools of thought when it comes to time travel as well, because is. All right, so this is where we could end up getting really confused and <laughs> blowing our own minds here. So there's the there's the there's one kind of you know if time is like you know a cycle or whatever like where you know uh, she got pregnant in order for her to get pregnant the first time around, Kari should have come back. Yeah. Um, you know, and it kind of creates this kind of loop where the events events should have ha- you know had to have happened in a certain order for history to have happened or the future to have happened. Yeah. Or is there when so like let's say time let's say time has taken you know taken its course and then you get to 2029 when Carl Reese is sent back into the f- into the past what if he's not sent back to the past that happened but he's sent back into an alternative past right because um so imagine if history and and it was you know once it's written there's no going back and changing it because and then and then he's sent when he's sent back he's not sent back to the history that's already happened he's, he's sent back to an alternative history because you can't change what's happened otherwise the moment he goes back to 1984 it could create a butterfly effect when none of the time yeah. travel stuff had ever happened so i think the only way this works is if he's sent to an alternative timeline but how would that alternative timeline affect his actual present because the whole point of him going back in time is to save his present or the mate or the moment he goes back to 1984 he, he creates an alternative time or, or an oh, alternative time okay. he's created sorry that's how i should have explained it yeah so, yeah, yeah so yeah, they're so not the, two the, separate things they become two separate things once it happens yeah yeah and then where it also gets a bit if you want to get really deep into it or maybe i don't know where the the if the terminator goes back first to 1984 and then kyle reese goes back because the terminator has already gone back he's off created an offshoot timeline yeah there's no saying that kyle reese has gone back to the same timeline that the yeah, terminator yeah. has gone to so yeah maybe there's some kind of multiverse kind of thing going on but that's i think that's if you overthink it and you try to rationalize it but i think yeah. the way the i don't think that's that was the intention of the, the film makes i think they went back in time and just yeah. modified and then modified it because i feel like they do i feel like the intention is to think that everything had to have happened the way it happened yeah i agree because you know the, the way that they breadcrumb it about his father and then yeah, the photo yeah. that she sees and then you see her at the end taking that photo it's all like it all is wrapped up into this one timeline and then it makes you think okay so all of those things have to happen for the next thing to happen and then yeah it just gets yeah yeah but then where it gets a bit where another layer of confusion gets added is Carl Reese tells Sarah Connor oh John sent um, told me to send you a message something like the future is not set or something you know you can make yeah. your own destiny or whatever that you, you you know the future is whatever you make it or some something yeah. weird like that which then implies that that it's not all set. The, the future is changeable. Yeah. But then if it's changeable, I think it, I, I wish the film had those deleted scenes added where the where the guy yeah. picks up the chip and we realize they're going to the Cyberdome factory because then it would almost make the events inevitable. Yeah. Because that's what's cool. One of the coolest parts about this film is thinking about time travel and thinking about like exactly the conversation we've just had that everybody will be having when they watch the film because they're like, oh, so does that mean this only happens because of this? Or what would happen if they did this? And the more breadcrumbs you can feed into a, a film like that, the cooler it becomes because you start thinking about it. It's, it's, it's 
quite like, uh, which I guess is time travel kind of, but um, space films where they talk about um, time being different in different places, like on different planets, like a year is a second or whatever. Then you start thinking like, oh, so if they've been there that long, how long has it been in here and all this stuff? And it, it just adds a lot of depth to a film because you have to really think about what it means when they say this. Oh, yeah. I mean, time, I think time, space and gravity are all interlinked, I think. I think because um, when you're sending someone back into time, you're not just sending them back to 1984. You're sending them to a certain space as well, a certain location. And now we're like on this planet that's moving around the sun at a billion miles an hour or whatever. And that sun is, our solar system is orbiting something else. Yeah. And that is orbiting some black hole in the middle of our galaxy. So we are pin- We need to pinpoint which part of the cosmos we're going back to. Where, where was the land. Earth? Where yeah. was the <laughs> Earth and where was Los Angeles in 1984 in our universe? So that's, yes. the, ti- that's the time and space link. So that that's where it really screws with your head. And Yeah, because you could, if you went back in time, you could just end up floating in the universe because you've missed your spot. <laughs> you've got the wrong time. Yeah, you would literally, <laughs> la- a Terminator would land in space and then they would like explode. Like, like implode or some or explode or or freeze or whatever yeah (laughs) it's too much to think about um (laughs) anyway i one other fact that i had which uh was about her uh, again something you probably know but um you know you talk about he sarah connor was supposed to go on that date with the guy but he cancelled yeah the the voice on the phone is james cameron that's right yeah yeah the they that the actress who played Sarah Connor married James Cameron, yeah, and yeah. then got divorced later in life. But it's funny that she, he was the one that cancelled on her. I uh, did they marry after this film? Or yeah, 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 yeah. They got. I think they married in like oh gosh, it was the nineties. They okay. I think that they they were married and divorced like by the time I think T two came out and before Titanic had arrived. Okay. But I think it was a very short marriage from what I can understand. Yeah. But it's kind of like you know she, he was flirting <laughs> with her in the film. But like being the boyfriend <laughs> absolutely and maybe he's john connor's initial father <laughs> yeah it, that <laughs> but, could have been a whole different film. but being the voice yeah <laughs> and um it, the producer on the movie uh gail ann heard was actually uh, uh james cameron's wife at the time of this movie oh, so wow was, so yeah God, she did he's... like yeah she did like uh she produced this for him aliens for him and the abyss him so she was like his 1980s producer and he left her for linda hamilton yeah then i think he met his next wife on titanic how many wives has he had oh loads so you know the old lady in titanic that he's telling the story you know her daughter it's been 84 years yeah Yeah. (laughs) i think her daughter is the lady who he's married to right now oh wow oh so he really does he he doesn't need tinder or anything he just makes films and then people just kind of marry him yeah but i think this is his uh his main wife i think so he's been with this one for like over 20 years yeah it's his fifth wife Mm. wow oh gosh she was married to Catherine bigelow as well i totally forgot she's another movie director like she's done some good movies oh like Zero Dark Thirty and oh uh, gosh, what's the one with Keanu Reeves? Point Break with Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves. Oh yeah, she's wow. like an accomplished award-winning director in her own right. Yeah, and Gail Ann Hurd. Yeah, he, he had a lot of very short relationships between the eighties and nineties. He he is notorious for being like a real taskmaster, like a per- perfectionist. You know, I think on the set, of, I don't know if it's a set of this movie or some some other movie. I think the the crew as a joke made T-shirts saying, uh, "I'm not scared of anybody. I I work for James Cameron or something <laughs> like that." Like, so he's he's one of the directors that give directors a bad name. But you know? but look at his career. Yeah. Look at his career. Aliens, Terminator, Titanic, you have to be a bit Avatar, crazy like, to be able to do to be this successful. Like I super think, successful like, people have these weird things and yeah, some sort of the Taskmaster. Because like I think his I think the out uh, of the top grossing movies of all time, his name's on that list like two or three times. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, with both the Avatars. <laughs> Yeah, at yeah. least anti Titanic. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I thought it was kind of kind of funny to be honest. But um, <laughs> do you know um, when um, uh, the Terminators are go- when Terminators going through the phone book looking for the people's names? Do you yeah. do you remember a time when those books existed and you Not could find really. anyone's name? No. Yeah. So that even in this country they existed. Like I remember yeah. seeing my dad's name with the house address 
and the telephone number next to it. Like you had to opt out to be out to, of to not books. be in it. I do remember asking my mum why there were loads of companies that had A names. And she was like, so they're first in the phone book. So yeah, like right. Albatross Taxis. It's always Albatross yeah, or something yeah. like that. So that they'll be at the front of the telephone That's book. Like, That's so That's clever. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting my drive, like my... So the person who ended up being my final driving instructor, like from the phone yeah. book, like the, the the yellow pages or whatever it was, it's uh, a different time. But imagine if, um, so, oh, here's another bit that was missing from the movie, but it's in the novelization. So Skynet knew Sarah Connor existed, uh, but they didn't know what she looked like, but they knew... So when the war had happened, a lot of documentation had been destroyed. Yeah. But they, they knew Sarah Connor was from California, or, you know, Los Angeles. And what they knew about her was she'd had some kind of uh, ice skating accident or whatever. So she had pins in her legs. Yeah. So what the Terminator would do is go back in time, kill uh, Sarah Connor and then check her leg to see if, yeah. if the pin's there. But that's I, something that was omitted from the movie. It wasn't in the first, and I, I think I read that somewhere because that is that's it is cool. But I suppose like I guess it doesn't change the story in any way, so you could not do it. Yeah, but it is, yeah, it is cool. Yeah, and I want I wonder how how it would how something like that would play out the search for Sarah Connor how it would play out today where if a Terminator came back today to twenty twenty four Instagram gosh, or Facebook. <laughs> 2024, this is 40 years after yeah. the movie, exactly 40 years almost. And, um, but imagine like, all the different variables that exist now that didn't really exist back then. So, other than was Sarah Connor her original name? Yeah. Did she change it to Sarah Connor? Yeah. So, who are you looking for? And <laughs> I mean, if, if, you, was Sarah, was, she, was Sarah her, her birth sex? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is yeah. there something she changed? Yeah. Like, like, how would you make that work today? Like, it's um. It, he, it's you'd, like... Your Terminators would have to be well versed in social media to come back and like look and people up and do a bit of stalking. It's social media, and they'd have to be good at um. I don't know. He, 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 what's the science of humanity? And I don't know. Yeah, sociology it's or like, whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. They'd have to be good at all that kind of stuff. I don't know. I think I think it's easier just to look through a phone book and just. It, he is right. The most efficient way is just to kill them all off. <laughs> I just, but <laughs> I, I also like him, yeah. I love that like they don't have the foresight to be like, okay, the Sarah Connor that he kills is like quite old. One of them. And it's like, well, clearly that's not Sarah Connor, but he doesn't care. So he's just like Sarah Connor. No. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And and the other ones like uh, like a Spanish girl he kills. Yeah. 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 It's like, could you not have whittled it down a, a little bit? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> or maybe he doesn't see colour or age or anything, because when you see the Terminator vision, everything's just really either red or black. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's all just code, so he's not yeah. he's not really thinking about it. it I found, there was a few things I found weird in the film, where, um, so... <laughs> As soon as the term the, the two time travelers have kind of landed, we see like a scene the next day where Arnie is walking through this kind of suburban town or s street, and he then breaks into a car to steal the car during the day. Yes, and I'm just thinking, like, what the hell was he doing the whole night? Like, why didn't he steal? <laughs> True. The car? Why didn't he steal the car at night when there's like no one around? And also, yeah, he's not going to be sleeping. So what's he doing? I thought his mission is just to get to Sarah Connor. Why was he taking a break? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought that was kind of kind of funny. There's a lot of uh, crushing moments here. So in the in in the beginning, you see the 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 future Terminator tank crush a bunch of skulls. Yes. In the future war, and then you see like a car crush like a toy truck. Yeah. And I think you see a uh, Terminator step on a few things. I think he steps on someone's glasses or something. He steps on something yeah. and crushes it. And then at the end of the movie, Terminator himself gets crushed. Gets crushed. And I never really put that link together. Oh, that's, before, that's until, cool. Like, I didn't right notice now. that. No, neither did I until like literally right this second, to be honest. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, more foreshadowing. And maybe it ties into the fact that it's all going to happen. It's all part of one timeline. M maybe he Terminator just has a crush on Sarah Connor. <laughs> 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 And, You're crushing and, it. Oh. 
<laughs> and um, I think this is uh, there's there, there's one bit where Terminator breaks character, which I didn't fully understand what was going on. But you know when he's after he's done his forearm and his eye, and he's in that hotel room, his kind of base of operations or whatever. Yeah. And he leaves the room, goes into the corridor, and holds his rifle or whatever, like at his shoulder, and he's just walking down this corridor, and the people in the corridor get scared of him. Yeah. Now Terminator is meant to be an infiltration unit. Like, why is he walking around in public? Yeah. With a gun on his shoulder. That yeah. that bit. It, even though it's a cool image, I think that's when he's heading off to the police station to destroy the police station. But um, yeah, you're but, right, and it's like, why spend all that time and money? I suppose making them look so human for them to do things that will obviously make them stand out. <laughs> Yeah, but if he's if if the term, terminator is programmed to do a certain mission, it will stick. It can only stick to that program. It yeah. can't like it can't it can't re. There's only so much it can deviate from that. So I think but one if, of its directives would have been to infiltrate because it's an infiltration yeah. unit. Yeah. But then it didn't. It didn't. Yeah. Hmm. But maybe it gets overridden because like he obviously then drives the car into the police station. That's not very you know sneak attack of him. So maybe there's like an o. It's overridden by the fact that he needs to kill her. That that's it doesn't really true. matter how you do it, you just get it done. Yeah, I suppose he could have just shot the receptionist yeah. and then just walked around. He was something. just being dramatic. He just he, wanted to make a dramatic entrance. Like, you, 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 you need some cool moments for the trailer. That's what yeah, you need. Exactly. That's, that's what it is, yeah. And is that the I'll be back? Yeah, it is. That's what he is, says, yeah. I'll be back. So, you know, right. it does become iconic. There's so many good lines in this film. And the fact that Arnie doesn't have any lines, basically, is very He's iconic. Like, he, he says like 10 words in the entire movie. Or yeah. something. <laughs> I wonder if he needed to learn the script or he just kind of, well, I mean, I'll be back wasn't, as everybody knows, wasn't the original thing he's supposed to be supposed to say. So he clearly can't even remember his 10 lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did a good job. And that became kind job. of his catch, catchphrase. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, oh gosh, I think we probably read the same thing where I think Arnie wanted to change the line or something. Mm. And, and James Cameron said, I don't tell you how to act. You don't tell me how to write my script or something weird like James that. James Cameron. But he yeah. was right. He, he was, was right. right. Sometimes you're not <laughs> all correct, James Cameron, with your 10 wives and you're <laughs> being mean to everyone. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm on his side. I'm rooting for him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought, I, I mean, Come With Me If You Want To Live was another line from this movie, which has just been reused in every Terminator movie. Yeah. I think yeah. Get Out as well. Get Out. I mean, I, I yeah, Get Out. Movie. I feel like Come With Me If You Want To Live is a very good way of getting someone to come with you. It's yeah. like, I'll explain later, just come with me. It's like, look, do you want to survive? Come with me. <laughs> yeah, I think as the sequels progressed, I think they, um, I might be mistaken, but I think they kind of morph the lines a little bit, like, come with me if you don't want to die. Or something like yeah. that. <laughs> but they're like, like ah, we're still saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it is interesting how the phenomenon of like what makes a film a cult classic happens. Because I'm sure that there are films within the same ilk as Terminator, but there's something so addictive about Terminator that makes you, that makes, that elevates it, even though it did have a small budget and even though it did have like a, a small cast. And I think it's just like a mix of everything we just said <laughs> makes it like a, it is unique. And I don't think there's anybody that I have ever met who hasn't seen it. And I'm very surprised if there is somebody that hasn't seen it. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I think it comes down to the fact that you, you, it, it's like a you you could turn the sound off in this movie and you could watch it and still understand what's going on. Yeah, it's a very kind yeah. of high concept movie where you could explain the concept to someone in you know whilst you're riding the elevator to you know the next floor. You know, it gets very yeah yeah yeah. You're right, and I, it's it's one of those films that like has been repeated so much because I even remember there was a recent time traveler Netflix series. I think it was called like. 19 it was a date like 1967 1960 no, something not seen it no and it was about like time travelers going to different time periods to solve a murder it was really good and they have the same time travel like experience so they all just pop up and they're really hurt and they're naked and they're like crawled up on the floor and they're like Ugh. oh I haven't and seen it's this. exactly the same type of time travel that they and I think it is an homage to Terminator because it's very like this the bit where Kyle lands 
basically mm. happens with all the other ones in, in that. So it's like, you know, these things do get replicated because they are yeah. so iconic and they all come from one place. Yeah, I think Terminator probably the original probably set the the gen set the generally accepted standards of a type of time travel in a movie. I guess yeah. maybe I don't know. It's difficult to believe that Back to the Future came out the year after this movie. Really? And, yeah, and it, it, to me, in my head, the gulf between these two movies, like Back to the Future, is such a well produced, beautiful looking film. And in my head, I feel like no, no, Back to the Future came out like six years after Terminator. Yeah. But it was only really, really the the year before. But that's the power of the budget, isn't it? It's like Terminator could have looked very different, I think, if they had a massive budget. I don't think it could would have looked as good, but it would have probably looked a lot more polished than oh, they did it such did. a good you can see every dollar of this movie on the screen. Yeah. Here's something that'll that might that might blow your mind. Have you seen Terminator 2? Yeah. So Terminator 2 also starts off with a future war scene. Mm. And, you know, that, and it's only like five minutes or something, maybe even less than that, maybe even like two minutes or something. The budget of that opening two minutes in Terminator 2 was more than the entire budget of Terminator 1. It's like, that's that's how, like, that's how much they wanted that sequel. (laughs) Wow. That's insane. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And um, I think uh, James Cameron wanted to start shooting Terminator sooner, but he couldn't because Arnie was busy shooting movies. Yeah, he, in... I think he was still in contract for Conan, the Conan one. The, yeah, the Destroyer. Yeah. Conan the Destroyer, yeah. And I think uh, in that time whilst he was waiting, he wrote Rambo 2, the first blood plot, part two, yeah. and Aliens. <laughs> whilst he was waiting so that's, that's crazy like... i mean that man does have an incredible brain I, I, i'll give him that and yeah it is a, it's a testament to his script writing abilities to be able to make films that although they're, they're in a similar genre in, in a lot of ways they are so different and you can just appreciate them for what they are and i also like that his first films were much more on the horror side like he did like a good you know creepy aspect of things which he does carry through in a lot of his films but he then goes into a lot of blockbusters afterwards so it's nice to see that his roots are like in our genre oh gosh yeah horror movies all the way man <laughs> oh yeah i think even though terminate the first term is uh, it's a science fiction movie also i th- i, I re- yeah i think we can agree it's it's a horror slasher movie dressed up as a yeah as a science fiction movie maybe yeah i mean mike watched this so it's not a horror film if, if oh, mike if it... walks, yeah if he could <laughs> if he can sit through it i'm not sure i can count it as a horror film because it's clearly not scary enough yeah for, for anyone listening that doesn't understand the reference mike is celia's other half and mike can't watch horror movies so if he was Cannot. comfortable with the terminator yeah, yeah. and actually a horror movie. <laughs> he fell asleep which isn't a testament to this being a bad film it just means he falls asleep at everything but it also meant that he was obviously not scared because he could snore for the last half an hour <laughs> <laughs> He would randomly wake up when like there was an explosion or something and go, whoa, whoa. But I was like, well, if you're not gonna stay awake, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk to you about it. 